Welcome to Faith Bridge. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today as we wrap up our two part sermon series on Christmas from beginning to end, the full story of Christmas. Pastor Adam got us off to a great start last week, helping us understand the beginning of Christmas. He gave us the backstory. He helped us understand why Christmas was even necessary in the first place. Because you see, originally, there was no need for Christmas. In the beginning, humanity enjoyed perfect, unbroken fellowship with God. The first two human beings, Adam and Eve, lived quite literally in paradise. Everything was just as it should be. And relationships with God and with each other and within themselves were perfect. All was as God intended until Adam and Eve decided to go their own way. They decided that they knew better than God. And through their disobedience to God, sin entered the world. And the world was broken. Adam and Eve became separated from God, the source of all life. They became separated from one another. Sin impacted not only the human experience, but all of creation was broken and fallen. And perhaps worst of all, there was absolutely nothing humanity could do about it. We had put ourselves in a predicament that we could not solve. Death had become our inevitable destiny, and we didn't have the wherewithal to do anything about death and brokenness in our fallen state. But thanks be to God, he was not going to give up on us. No, he loved us far, far too much. And so he purposed to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And 2,000 years ago, he took on human flesh. He came into this world as a little baby for the express purpose of saving us from our predicament, of doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's where Christmas began. Today, we want to look at the other side of the equation. How's it going to end? What, what is Christmas moving toward? How is it all going to culminate? I mean, we've been celebrating it now for 2,000 years. Surely it is going somewhere. Well, how is it going to culminate? Well, there are two answers, actually, to that question, two answers that are both equally true. One answer is rather simple and straightforward, unambiguous. The other answer is a bit more complicated. The simple, straightforward answer is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. We'll be reading from that chapter. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. We read appropriately from the book of Revelation where all things culminate. Revelation 21, the Apostle John writes these words, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything 
knew. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Yeah, the simple, straightforward answer to how Christmas will culminate is that God will ultimately have his way. Things are going to be like he wanted them to be from the very beginning. Things are going to return. Things are going to be redeemed. All things are going to be made new. Suffering and pain and sorrow and death and sadness, all will be gone. Because God will have his way. That's what Christmas is moving toward. That's the simple, straightforward answer. But as I said, there is also... A second answer, equally true, but a bit more complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because the answer is up to you and me. It's up to us. You see, God gets to decide how Christmas culminates on a, on a grand universal scale. But he lets us decide how Christmas will culminate on a personal scale individual level. He lets us decide whether or not we will join him in the redemption of the world. He lets us decide whether or not we will be a part of the new creation. As Adam pointed out to us last week, Pastor Adam, not Adam from Genesis. (laughs) As Adam pointed out to us last week, love requires choice. Love can never be forced. God desires a genuine, true, authentic love relationship between himself and his creation. And the only way that can take place is if we are allowed to choose. Will we join him in the redemptive work? Or will we choose to go our own way? Will we be a part of the new creation and enjoy the blessings of eternal life? Or will we foolishly choose to go our own way as our very first parents did and suffer that very same fate of separation from God? So the question for us is, how do we go about making the right choice? How can we be sure that we're going to choose as God would have us choose, as God desperately desires that we choose? God is at work even right now redeeming all of creation and he's wooing us and he's drawing us to himself and he's giving us every opportunity to join him in that and to make the right choice. But how do we appropriately exercise our free will and join him in the renewal of all things. Well, the answer is found in verse 5 of the passage that we just read. In verse 5, baby Jesus, the one born 2,000 years ago, is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the undisputed King of the universe. He has brought all of his enemies under his feet. And he has defeated death, and he is king. And as king, he says, I am making everything new. In that simple sentence are three very important truths for us to understand and implement if we are to join him in the redemption of the world. And the first truth is found in the very first word, I, I am making everything new. Jesus is clear. I and I alone am making everything new. You know, we human beings have a deep, inescapable desire to be made new. There is this drive within us that we can't get away from that is constantly moving toward some kind of renewal. And this truth will never be more evident 
as it will be in about 10 days on New Year's Day when gym memberships will skyrocket <laughs> and enrollment at Weight Watchers will go through the roof and commitments will be made to stop smoking, to quit overspending, to stop swearing, fill in the blank. We are inveterate starter overers. You are and I am too. And even when New Year's Day is a distant memory, six, seven months from now, we'll still be engaged in the process as we get new hair color, new hairstyle, new wardrobe, new job, new hobby, new adventure, new something. You see, each of us is aware at some level that we're wearing out. We're fading. This body of ours isn't going to last. And all of these activities, to some degree, are a vain attempt on our part to be made new. But as we will learn about six weeks from now, all of our attempts fall short. None stick. None last. Oh, we may make progress for a little while, but eventually we'll fall off of the wagon. We'll give up on the commitment. We'll decide it wasn't so important after all. The cake will look too good. <laughs> the gym will look dreadful. Whatever the commitment or promises we make to ourselves, they won't last. Because there's only one who makes a lasting promise. And it is the king of kings who says, I am making everything new. Jesus does not share redemption. He gives it freely, but he is its sole source. That's why the apostle Peter said in the book of Acts, there's no other name by which we may be saved. No other name under the sun. Jesus alone is the key to salvation. And so I ask you this morning, are you ready to give up on your tired, unproductive efforts? Uh, are you here today without ever having made a commitment to the one who can fully and finally redeem you and renew you. Friends, I can't think of a better way to celebrate Christmas than to step into that relationship for the very first time. And it is yours for the asking. There is no cost because the price was paid on Calvary, on the cross, and it is yours for the asking. And if you're here today and you're hearing this message for the first time, I have to think that it's no accident that you were here, that God wanted you to know he wants to renew you for all of eternity. And if you have made that decision already, I would pose this question to you. Why do you continue with the vain pursuits? Why do you not then focus all of your energies upon the true renewal, the lasting renewal? The last I checked, the death rate was holding steady at 100%. <laughs> Our only hope of escape is through the renewal that Jesus offers us. Are we so caught up in the renewal of things that won't last, that we've forgotten about the things that will? If that is the case, then I would propose that this New Year's is not a time for New Year's resolutions. Perhaps it is a time for New Year's repentance, examining our hearts and turning our hearts and refocusing on the one who can bring renewal. Jesus says, I am the one who can do it.
And secondly, he says, I am making everything new. Not I'm going to one day. No, I am. That's present tense. That's right now, today. Jesus is working redemption and renewal right now. But somewhere along the way, we got it into our heads that this life is just a season of toughing it out. Yeah, it's bad. In fact, sometimes it's awful. But we've just got to grit our teeth, hold on and get through it. And then in the next life, that's when it's all going to be good. That's when it's all going to be new. That's not biblical. Jesus says, I am making everything new. Right now, today, he invites us not only to experience renewal, but to join him in the work of renewal. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the country of Nepal, the, the nation at the top of the world, as they say, nestled in the highest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. We flew into the capital city of Kathmandu, and through a translator, our driver told us that we still had about a six-hour drive ahead of us to our destination, the town of Pokhara which after a 24-hour flight really didn't sound too bad. What he did not tell us was that the back seat of his Corolla, where I would be sitting, had no cushioning whatsoever. I may as well have been sitting on a wooden bench. Nor did he bother to tell us that we would be traveling on one of the top 10 most dangerous roads in the world. You can go on YouTube and look at it. It's on every top 10 list, the road to Pokhara. Just the week before, a busload of folks had plummeted hundreds of feet to their death into a ravine. He conveniently forgot to mention these things. And, you know, in the Himalayas, there are no rest stops. There are no buckies with clean <laughs> bathrooms. If you need to make a pit stop, you run into the woods, you go down a steep bank. When the sixth hour had come and gone, I asked the driver, how much further? And he said to me, it with the only English, honestly, that I think he could speak, about an hour. which I would learn was an utterly meaningless phrase. <laughs> and I was becoming consumed with the destination. All I could think about was getting there. My backside was killing me. I was uncomfortable. I was tired. I was getting more upset by every mile. But somewhere long, probably about the eighth hour, it dawned on me I am so consumed with the destination that I'm missing out on the journey. We were driving through some of the most beautiful scenery in the world, soaring mountain peaks, plummeting valleys, absolutely gorgeous. I was missing it all because I was so focused on the destination. I purposed then and there to get my mind off of Pokhara and begin to pay attention. And I really can't describe how the change in perspective changed everything for me in what would ultimately be a 10-hour drive. I was able to enjoy the last several hours of it because I quit worrying about where we were going and I paid attention to where we were. I understand that sometimes this life can be painful, can be terrifying, can be difficult. But have the difficulties of this life so dimmed our vision that we can't see the renewal that's happening all around us? Are we so focused on the hereafter 
that we do not have eyes to see what's going on in the here and now because, friends, according to the word, he is doing something right now. He's not waiting around until we're all dead. No, I am making all things new. There is no other day on the calendar like Christmas that reveals the missional heart of God, his desire to reach out to us, to save us, and to renew us. And he desperately wants us to understand that is for today. That's not for the future. That is for right now. Are you stepping into the renewal right now? Jesus alone can bring it about. And he's doing it today. And finally, he says, I am making everything new. In the New Testament, there are two Greek words used for new. The word neos and the word kainos. The word neos refers to... um, time, to duration, things that haven't been around very long are neos. A neos baby, for instance. A new car right off the line is neos. But kainos, which is the word used in our text, doesn't have anything to do with time or duration. It refers to quality, It refers to the state of being made new regardless of the age, regardless of the condition. And when Jesus says, I am making everything new, he's telling us that he is taking this broken planet on which we live, however old and broken down it may be, and he is renewing it. And one day it will be fully renewed no matter how broken down it becomes. He's telling us that one day our bodies will be raised from the grave no no matter how long they've been there. And they will be made fully, fully new. That's the kind of newness that Jesus is bringing about. Even as we speak, the question is, are we joining him in that work? Are we experiencing it ourselves? When my wife Becky and I were first married, I was a doctoral student, and she was uh, the only one gainfully employed at the time, so money was a little tight. Well, I remember one Saturday, um, she had been out uh, yard sailing. I never understood why they call it yard. It should be called yard buying. I mean, that's... It's really what's going on. But she came home and uh, she had a, a pedestal breakfast table that was bright orange. Do you, do you remember the shade of orange that VW bugs were back in the 70s? It was that, it was that shade of orange. Horrendous. I looked at her, I said, What is that? She said, This is our new breakfast table. I said, It's orange. How much did you spend? A hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? We don't have a hundred. Would you just calm down? She took her fingernail and she scratched the top of the table. She said, there's a table under here. Trust me. Well, I looked and underneath the orange was a coat of avocado green. I said, I'm not feeling real comforted right now. She waved me off. Because we were newlyweds, I had not yet had time to appreciate my wife's magical powers when it comes to furniture refinishing. And she went to work, stripping the orange, stripping the avocado green, sanding, 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 refinishing. And sure enough, As she said, there was a beautiful oak pedestal table under there that still serves as our breakfast table 24 years later. 
She took something that was ugly and unattractive and made it kainos. And that's what Jesus wants to do with you. That's what Jesus wants to do with everyone. The only question is, will we let him? Will we invite him to do the work within us that only he can do? In 2 Corinthians, uh, the apostle Paul says, you know, take heart, take heart. Even though on the outside we're wasting away, on the inside, we are being renewed day after day after day. And that is our eternal destiny. Jesus will be making all things new today and forever. We will continually experience kainos in the redemptive power of Jesus. Two thousand years ago, God took on flesh. He chose to become one of us. And he did so to rescue us from a self-made problem that we could not solve. And he extends to each one of us the promise, the hope, the blessing the Christmas blessing of renewal and redemption, full, free, and complete, eternal. If you have never experienced that, if you have yet to step into that, today is your day. In just a few moments, L.A. is going to lead us in a song. And as he does that, I, I'm going to be down front here with some of our prayer partners. And if, if you're ready to make that decision, I wish you'd come pray with me or one of our prayer partners. If you have already made that decision, then as your missions pastor, I have an assignment for you. Over the next two days, Pastor Ken is going to be presenting the good news of the gospel in a simple, straightforward, accessible manner. And because we are the recipients of that good news and because we fully understand what that good news means, I can't think of anything more selfish than keeping it to ourselves. That's the ultimate Scrooge-like behavior. And so I want you to begin thinking and praying about who you can invite to come to one of our Christmas Eve services. You know, you will never have a greater chance of success in inviting someone to church than you will at the holidays. Be thinking and praying for them even now and inviting them to come so that they can hear the greatest news that they will ever hear. And by God's grace, step into the fullness, the beginning, the end, the fullness of what Christmas is all about. Stand with me as we pray. Father, how grateful we are that in the fullness of time, your son Jesus came to save us. Thank you for loving us and forgiving us and for desperately wanting us back. Lord, in these days, we lift our hearts to you and we pray, oh God, you would give us a vision of what you're doing in this world and show us how we might join you to be a part of it all as you make everything new. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.